everyone, and welcome to this webinar session uh, in which we hope to talk about the use of textbooks in our classrooms. Indeed, the last three years or so has witnessed significant changes in our approach to the teaching of, of English. And the textbook certainly plays an important role in the way we uh, approach our lessons. Joining me today is uh, one Pamela Esther Devadasan. She is a senior English language teacher at Sekolah Menengah Kebangsaan Sri Mutiara Churas Kuala Lumpur. Uh, welcome to this Thank session, Pamela, and thank you for joining me. So, um, as I said, over the last three years, we have witnessed significant changes in the way we uh, approach the teaching of, of English. And this has been uh, the result of the introduction of the KSSR and KSSM in our primary and secondary schools. Um, what has contributed significantly to the changes is the introduction of the CEFR aligned syllabus. Uh, across, uh, right now, it's uh, years one, two, three, four. four, as well as forms one, two, three, three and four. So we are coming full cycle pretty soon. When there was uh, this change to the CFR line curriculum, obviously we teachers, we knew about this change and we were uh, getting ready for the change and we were familiarizing ourselves with the new curriculum. But it was the introduction of the textbook which really brought this new uh, change uh, to the national platform, because when the textbooks were introduced, the internationally distributed English language textbooks, uh, the introduction created quite a bit of uh, controversy. There were questions raised about why is there a need for such textbooks in our classrooms. This, is, this was uh, to be expected, uh, simply because we have, for the last several decades, uh, we've been using uh, textbooks which have been written and published by Malaysians. But I think uh, we need to, before we go on to talking about the textbook and non-textbook based lessons, talk briefly about the rationale behind why we introduce these internationally distributed textbooks. Um, when the decision was made to draw on the CFR and ensure that our syllabus was aligned to the CFR, we had to make the decision on the kind of books that we wanted to use in our classrooms. I suppose the choice was between using textbooks uh, which were locally produced and then having those textbooks aligned to the can-do statements of the CFR or make use of textbooks which are already out there in the market, already aligned to the CFR, but not containing local elements. Between the two, it was decided that we would be better off having textbooks which were aligned to the CFR and then trying to incorporate local elements as we progressed, simply because we did not have the kind of skills needed to come up with a CFR aligned textbook immediately. Um, but several years have now passed and we are now uh, we now see the textbooks, CFR aligned textbooks, in years four and years uh, and form four as well. So, Pamela, as a teacher, what has your experience been with using these these internationally distributed textbooks? Thank you, Dr. Ramesh. Hello, everyone. Let me backtrack a little bit. It's been three years now, and when I first started, I had to start with Pulse. Okay, my first year was with Pulse. When I first got this book, honestly, it was frightening. For so many years, you know, you walk into class with this, and I know the 15 chapters by heart. Right? Suddenly, at the age, the grand age of 53, I'm told I have to use this. Just opening the textbook was already, you know, things I was not familiar with. Even the way it has been written, I had to get used to it being in columns, number one. And then the content of it. 
all overseas material, right? Added to this were, you know, things like we had the teacher's book, such a thick teacher's book, and then again inside, you know, very well written, but this this part of it is a textbook, and then there I have detailed guideline given to me, yeah, and and to read, to understand, and to implement within a short frame of time. But three years later, I am so glad, truly glad, that I have had these materials all along, so that you know, being in class, standing with the CEFR aligned curriculum, something which is new, something which I have to implement. I'm very confident that the material I have is aligned material, and I don't have to worry about you know looking for material pitched at a right level. I know what I'm using has already been decided internationally that it is right and correct. All I had to do was read, understand, implement. Let's let's talk about the challenge that, that you you mentioned just now in terms of content and, and content uh, not being appropriate and how that was something that immediately caught your attention and you were concerned about. How did you maneuver this issue of content which was alien to your students? Honestly, Dr. Ramesh, it was not just alien to my students. As a teacher, some of the content was actually alien to me. Mm. Right? All along, we, are dealing, we have been dealing with books which you know, very Malaysian-based being a Malaysian, I'm very comfortable with Malaysian base. Now I have content. Then I needed to understand one simple thing. It is not the content I'm teaching. You know, it is the language skill. The children needed the content to acquire a certain le uh, learning standard. So I didn't have to worry so much about the content. Rather, I needed to shift my focus to the simple fact that I'm actually teaching the learning standard and the language skill, right? Um, but so can I just interject there? Yeah. I think I think there's there's a lot of literature out there already that says that when we introduce language uh, to children, ideally we familiarize or we introduce language which is within the realm yeah. and world world experience of the child, okay. and then kind of take them out. All right. um, obviously. These textbooks were not the ideal. Uh, what would have been ideal was that we had CFR line textbooks, which were very much, you know, Malaysian in context, where teachers could could help uh, students uh, uh, relate to the subject matter and then take them out gradually. Um, but we knew at that point already that we did not have such books available, and so we had to uh, man to make the best use that we could with the material that was already CFR aligned and available right. out there. And these books were for an international uh, audience. So um, they were not necessarily UK centric or, or, or US centric, but you know, you had elements from different parts of the world. Um, but was that, was that so much of a problem you know, no, uh, no. With, with your students? Uh, as a teacher, I had to do a little bit of homework, of course. Mm -hmm but then you always have to do homework when you have to prepare for a lesson, right? So um, let's take the example of Halloween that right. raised a lot of issues. Okay. In my classes, that was one of my best lessons. How so? Be because that gave me space to actually incorporate a lot of um, higher order thinking skills. Okay. How did I make the content more relevant to my children? we brought in what is being practiced in Malaysia regarding uh, death and you know things like that. So the, my, my Chinese kids could talk about Hungry Ghost Festival, right? My uh, Christian kids would talk about All Souls Day and things like that. And my Muslim kids could come up with why they don't practice Halloween. So there was a lot of honest discussion in class and I could actually mold the kids, you know, the thinking skills of the kids. So the, the content kind of allowed you to to bring the discussion yes. closer to the experience of the, right. of the students. So it, it was, yes, an overseas kind of content, but using that, I could bring about local, you know, not make it so alien, 
right? Um, I also had children who asked me if, you know, this is not appropriate. Why do our supermarkets sell it? Mm. You know, they actually have all this in the malls and the supermarkets. So we went on to, you know, a different tangent of discussion. Um, it also allowed me to, to inculcate our moral values. Yeah. You know, for the for the teachers out there, you know, who may be listening to you and saying, well, you are teaching in Charas, Kuala Lumpur, you know, your children have completely different experience from, say, children in, in rural parts of the country. How do we bridge the gap between the kind of content available in these books uh, to their realm of experience? I mean, we could bring about all kinds of superstitious beliefs, right, uh, which is practiced by the others, okay, see, um, let's take this to Sabah, Sarawak. I'm sure the indigenous groups have got their own practices. Right. So localizing the overseas content, it is not so difficult. Mm. I mean, I had to try it myself. Right. Initially, yes, when you look at the book, you know, that the first impression you get, but actually sitting with it, taking the trouble to read the teacher's guide, you know, and then delving into it, Sometimes I don't have the time to go and source. I've not visited Spain, and there's mention of Spain. You know, there's this Amish teenager, and I, that's also, I just have very little knowledge about Amish. There's a metro link. I've never been on a metro link. But my children could help me, and I had to Google a little bit. But then again, when I also use the local material, right, which I've been doing for 29 years, mention of Gawai festival and things like that, I still have to Google. I still have to ask because I don't celebrate Gawai. Mm -hmm. So either way, I have to do my homework, right? right? Yeah, um, to bridge the gap for the children or sometimes get the kids to help me along. Now, I must say, I mean, I was a, a teacher as well, a school teacher some years ago. Um, when I saw the scheme of work that was provided in the KSSR and the KSSN, my immediate reaction was, was, you know, I was really impressed. The fact that so much was being given to, to the teachers. And I understood that because of this new uh, change in, in the curriculum and the introduction of the CFR aligned uh, uh, framework, uh, teachers needed greater support. And these schemes of work actually provide teachers something to fall back on. I don't believe that teachers are necessarily too tied down to the scheme of work, but what are your thoughts on this? What, what kind of uh, uh, benefits are there to, the, to these schemes of work that are provided? See, as an English language teacher, I can honestly say I'm very blessed because the whole scheme of work has been laid out for me mm. for 120, uh, 112 lessons. Mm. That means my whole year is set. Okay. The learning stand, the content standard, the learning standard, even the lesson outline is there. But, and that lesson outline is based on the textbook we are using. So, but am I really forced to follow word for word, or uh, is there a, a, a circular which says that you know you need to follow the lesson outline and you have no choice? No, I always have a choice. What I don't have a choice is that that learning standard for that lesson. Okay. So these these schemes of works, you know, whether it be for year one, year two, year three, year four, even the secondary schools, um, specific references are made to certain pages in the textbook, right? right? And so teachers are able to quickly uh, match yes. uh, um, whatever is spelled out in the scheme of work to what is presented uh, in, in the, the textbook. textbook. Um, there may be some who argue that, that the scheme of work is, is too prescriptive. And for example, uh, I may be teaching uh, a year three or a year four classroom. And let's say if it's a year four classroom, uh, and I am introducing material which is at uh, high A1, right? Okay. That's the ideal, because the textbook essentially represents the ideal. That's where the student needs to be. Right. Uh, but I may be teaching in a school in some part of Malaysia and my, my students may not, have, may not be at that level. It's possible that they are below that level or they could be above that level. 
in cases like that, how does this textbook help me? See, Dr. Ramesh, the textbook has been pitched at that level, which the student needs to be, right? And we talk about uh, CAFR being, you know, it's all about the student, what the student can do. So if your student is not at that level, it's lower and only can do this. The textbook will help me bridge the gap because from the textbook, I know, okay, you know, the reading text has to be roughly this long or this is the kind of vocabulary this ch child needs to handle and needs to acquire, right? Uh, the grammar items needed, okay? Uh, the speaking skills, the listening skills. So if I know my child is not there yet, by just looking at the textbook as a resource material, right? right I am better equipped to bridge the gap because I need to take every child of mine to that level, right? The starting points may all be different. That is reality, okay? So, so the textbook essentially... Uh, serves as kind of a, a, a guide to tell you where the aspirational level yes. is. This is right. where your student should be. This is the kind of vocabulary that the student should be able to manage. Right. This is the kind of structure, or grammatical structures that the student should be able to, uh, to, to handle. Yeah. And it is up to the teacher then to ascertain where the, the child is and then whether uh, there is a need to supplement uh, material in the textbook with other resources right. to bring the child up or if the child is above that level then at least the teacher can talk about the performance of the child in very tangible terms to say well my students are above right. a high A1 they probably already at a mid A, uh, A2 for example yes. right. right and and I think this is what we hope that the CFR aligned curriculum will allow teachers to do and not just to describe students as, you know, being good or average or weak, but more in terms of what can the student do, do right. right, at this, this yeah. uh, particular level. I, I, I like to add that if you look at the DSKP, right, it, it says the minimum. Nobody said that the child cannot be beyond, right. you know. Mm. So if the child is, be, you know, if it's supposed to be A2 high mm. and the child is already B2, why not? Mm -hmm. Then you have to do more challenging activities mm -hmm. and you have this project-based learning and you know, mm -hmm. now you even have a community-based learning mm -hmm. and the child can move. Mm -hmm. We don't have to stop the child and say, no, you need to be A1 high. Mm -hmm. Because if we, if we read the DSKP clearly, it says minimum, the child can be beyond, mm -hmm. right? What we worry about is the children who have not reached that level so with the textbook, I am confident because that book has been pitched at the right level. So when I look at the textbook, whether it's overseas content or not, but the vocab use, the structures use, the learning, and the, the four skills the children need to acquire. From that, I know that... They are universal, aren't they? Yes. Right? Yes. So regardless of what the content is, right. the skills are... Right pitched at where, uh, the, where the aspirational target yes. is. Right. So if my child is that low, mm. then I know she needs to go there mm. because the textbook is my guide. Mm. It's just a guide. Right. Then I know, okay, this is the gap mm. I need to address as right. a teacher. Right. Right? right? So that would help me. The scheme of work, yes, the lesson outline is there. Why? That is to ensure that we, com we teach both the main skill and the complementary skill. And that we, we don't we don't get carried away with the activities we are doing and forget that our purpose is to actually ensure that our children achieve the main skill and the complementary skill. And the outline given in the scheme of work is much simpler than in the teacher's guide. The teacher's guide is more detailed. And that's you know? To allow teachers more room to maneuver. Yes. Right. Yeah. Okay. You know, so right. you you, um, you you are free. Um, you have the guiding light. I mean, we are teachers, English language teachers, and every child who goes through our hand needs to have reached that certain level. 
whether the child is taught in Perak or Slango or even in KL, right? So it sort of gives us a certain standard and, and we can, you know, either okay. go up yeah. or go down, right? right. So Pamela, let's, let's uh, zoom in on the, the title of this webinar, which is uh, textbook-based lessons and non-textbook-based lessons. Okay. Now, when I first uh, heard these phrases, um, I was thinking back to the time back in the day when I was a teacher again, where I was, I had a syllabus, and based on the syllabus, I would design my lessons. I didn't consciously decide that this is going to be a textbook-based lesson, and this is going to be a non-textbook-based lesson. There would have been parts in my lesson which, which uh, required me to uh, refer to the textbook, and there would be sometimes when I would divert, I, may brought, I could have brought in newspaper articles, for example. So what is this idea? you know, your understanding of what a textbook-based lesson is and a non-textbook-based lesson is. Okay. Just let me explain a little bit. In Form 1, Form 2, Year 1, Year 2, right. okay, Form 1, Form 2, they started with punks. Right. Year 1, Year 2, they started with Super superminds, right? right? Yeah. And, yeah. you know, these two for forms and these two uh, years shared the textbook. Mm -hmm. Because there was not enough units for both years, the introduction of non-textbook came in. Right. Okay. So you find in year one, year two, form one, form two, if we talk about non-textbook, the teachers will also have to prepare full units and that deals with skills, teaching of the skills. Mm -hmm. But the beauty of um, the learning standard is they are repeated. Okay. So you get them in the textbook and we have the textbook mm -hmm. and then they are repeated also in the non-textbook. The rule is by the end of the academic year, the child must achieve those learning standards. Right? So when you have the non-textbook, you also have to prepare uh, skills. Then we also have other requirements by MOE, our literature in action. Right? So we have those days we used to call it um, literature component. And all these books are still around. See? Yeah, we still have to use them. But also, so, sorry again, if yeah. I just interrupt. Uh, with year one, year two, form one, form two, the non-textbook based lesson was also an opportunity, or is still an opportunity, for teachers to address this lack of local content, yes. right? Yes, yeah. So they're still dealing with the same learning standards, right. but now they have this, this opportunity to bring in uh, local content to kind of offset the, the international nature of, of the textbooks yeah. uh, that they have. Thank you. Now, can I share you with you an example? Yeah. All right. Find that this is a chapter I found difficult personally, but managed to address. Um, in Unit 7, this is for Form 2. All right. Okay. We had to deal with the Amish, Amish teenager, yeah. Amish, okay, and Metrolink. Okay. Okay. And this was a textbook topic, Unit 7. My kids struggle. I mean, none of us had been on Metrolink. And this was something, you know, somebody unknown. So what I did with the non-textbook, after Unit 7, the next cycle was non-textbook. Right? I didn't look for something new. I extended this because I felt my children needed more time. How did you extend it? So from the Amish teenager, we went on to the Malaysian teenager. You now we did compare contrast, right? And uh, beyond that, my kids actually went on and said, let's talk about a US teenager. Okay, when we came to the Metro Link, uh, this was good in the sense that the next theme was consumerism and financial awareness. So from Metro Link, we linked, in, linked it to our LRT, and then we talked about how much you have to pay and, you know, the routes and how do you go and a little bit of compare contrast. So the focus again was on the skills. Yes. Right? Yes. And not no. not no. Uh, bogged down by the content no. itself. And right. because this content was a little bit heavy and right. a little bit out of this world, right. I had the leeway of using the non-textbook to, you know, explore further and link it locally. 
let's let's get back to again this definition of the non-textbook and okay. textbook-based lessons. All right. You talked about year one and year two, form one and form two. All right. We know uh, for a fact that uh, teachers in forms one and two share the same textbook. Right. Teachers in years one, one and two share the same textbook. Okay. And they find a scheme of work where the non-textbook based lesson refers to the need for the teachers to, like you say, uh, develop skill-based lessons right. in addition to dedicating time for the teaching of the literature component right. and uh, civics and things like that. Um, but this definition of non-textbook based lesson changes a little bit, doesn't it, yes. for, for years three and four as well right. as forms three and four? Right. See, Dr. Ramesh, whatever is not in the textbook is considered non-textbook. Okay. Right. So maybe we can look at the slide. Yeah. Okay. Right. If we look at the slide for year four scheme of work, you find that the non-textbook includes our contemporary children's literature, okay, as well as project-based learning. Okay. Now that's written in the scheme of work. What we teachers need to do is read the first few pages mm -hmm. instead of straight jumping in into our lessons. Okay. And if we go to the next slide you find that you know this is for the um, primary school, the SJK scheme of work year four. And if you look at the learning outline, you see this is non-textbook, right. right? And you see the main skill, the language arts is there. You have the main skill, the complementary skill, listed for the teacher. Right. So it, it's not that the teacher has been left alone and you need to grow up and you know, struggle. The scheme of work is still there learning outline also given and this is based on the contemporary children's literature okay let me give you one more example so if you look at the form three that was primary yeah? form three what are the non-textbook lessons here there are four you have the literature in action you have revision you have project-based learning and there's one writing lesson lesson 108 you know if we look at the next slide you find that this is lesson 108 writing skill okay because in the textbook it's report writing and it's not in the curriculum so when they designed the scheme of work we made it a point to mention and you know you inform the teacher you need to develop your own lesson but then again guided by the learning standard so uh, what is important i feel is the guiding principle is the learning standard Sure. Yeah. yeah, and um, so you, you, you find this is there, right? So in Form 4, you see, Form 3, Form 4, the joy is we don't share textbooks. Right. No, we have the whole textbook, Year 3 and Year 4 as well. So you have enough Why units. do you say that's a joy? I don't have to prepare non-textbooks so much. Right. Or rather, my non-textbooks are all, you know, literature component where, you know, literature in action where I can, I, the children are free to express themselves and, you know, I get to do reader's theatre and choral reading and my kids get to open up, you know, and when I have uh, the textbook there for all the units, it's not that I'm 100% dependent, there are times I need to modify, there are times I need to simplify, that I need, need to adapt, sometimes I need to add or even subtract. Right, but assured that okay, I'm standing in class. I'm doing things right because the guiding light is there. No, though I don't hundred percent, you know. Uh, so. Right. So, Tanya, let's uh, let's address the needs of because I, I'm sure as much as we as you know as much as you know you have kind of digested the. Syllabus. And, I still am. You're, you're still learning, <laughs> yes. but, but there are going to be. I'm sure there are teachers out there who are, to some extent at least, still struggling right. with wrapping their minds around this change yes. in the in the curriculum. You know, um, why do you think there are you know uh, teachers who are still struggling with uh, preparing lessons for CFR online curriculum? You know, and uh, what do you think needs to be done to to support that? Okay. Um, when this whole whole roadmap thing and you know the the reform started, um, we we had quite a bit of training. Right. Initially. Right. And then we had uh, learning material adaptation. Right. 
and then we had uh, formative curriculum, induct correct, uh, curriculum induction, right. formative assessment. Right. Curriculum induction was done, you know, like form one, form two together, okay. and then form three, and then form four. Now, initially, when the trainings were done, and when it was cascaded back to schools, in certain schools, it was the the afternoon session teachers, especially when you have these two session schools. Yes. And because it was more for form one, form two, because it started with form one, form two, or year one, year two, right. so it it was that group of teachers focused mm. and paid more attention to all the different trainings. Because it was the immediate need. Yes. Yeah. See, today, CFR aligned curriculum has come up to form four, year four. Right. Now you're having the upper secondary teachers involved and some of them have missed the basic training right so addressing i mean realizing this trying to address this gap so you have a team of master trainers super master trainers who, who were selected to come up with the guide right because even the trainings were done in isolation do you do you think it's it's possible for a teacher to uh, go into a classroom now to teach form four or maybe next year form five without having gone through those those sessions that were that we talked about just now the familiarization the materials adaptation the uh, curriculum induction would a teacher who has had no exposure to those sessions still be able to pick up the DSKP and look at the scheme of work and um, manage uh, an entire year without without that background information? See, that's a difficult question, uh, Dr. Ramesh, in the sense that my age group may not have so much of a problem, generally speaking, because um, we used to teach the communicative syllabus those days. And this is going back to communicative syllabus. Oh, yeah. But the finer details, the finer points, if we didn't go for the training, uh, then, then we are missing quite a big gap. Right. See, like formative assessment, mm. it has a big impact, right. and, we and it can be defined in so many different right, ways. Right, right. And if you had attended the training, you would remember the nine building blocks. See, now if I ask you what are the nine building blocks, and you don't know, then I know you have missed out. So, aren't you doing it in class? And and how do you gauge? when your children have achieved or not achieved and are moving you know or are you just doing activity activity because you have planned your lesson plan that way and you need to fulfill and complete that but little thinking of whether the children have achieved or not achieved right. see so, so the the uh, other issue is with finding the time to you know to have these, these sessions you know to go right. in for this this, this training and to, to read up on the CFR. Um, I think uh, one of the reasons why yeah. this, this particular publication has come out is because uh, we see uh, the need for teachers to have some kind of a quick reference yes. in order to help them uh, maneuver, right, the right. language lessons. Can you talk a little bit more about, about this? Okay, you, if you would just, you know, have spend some time going through, it's a very thin, thin book. Nothing much, I think an hour is enough to actually read, find that the book, the content of the book is very simple. It's just back to what the teacher needs to do in class. A book written by teachers for teachers, and of course with the council overseeing and reading, right? And it's incorporating everything. Let's just go through a little bit, no, Dr. What exactly Ramesh? does the book offer? Okay, um, I'm teacher. gonna skip the introduction because most of them will do that. But then again, if you know, nothing about CAFR, then this is a real simple introduction to what it is all about, you know, and what is expected from the teacher, okay? And then you have the chapter two, where you have the documents which are relevant and which a teacher needs to use, and of course become familiar with to be better practitioners of the CEFR aligned curriculum. You go to chapter three, would be actually writing and planning a lesson, and that pulls in whatever we have been exposed to in uh, familiarization, learning material adaptation, as well as formative assessment and curriculum induction. And um, the team has tried to make things simple by being more 
graphic and you know sometimes you just have to look at the graphic to know whether the steps are correct then again they've also listed the available resources around already given to us by ministry i mean the whole table is full of them it's just not the textbook you have the workbook you have the workbook is only for the teachers to use as a supplement you have the teachers book and then you have the cds the audio this year we even got interactive board cds which is you know every year we seem to be getting more okay and then you have the steps on exactly how you start when you pick up the scheme of work and when you look at the skills and then how do you develop it into the lessons now if you look at the back from uh, pages 20 onwards you have some lesson plans right right I must be very honest and say that these are not perfect lesson plans. I mean, we teachers prepare for other teachers. It may work in your school. It may not work in your school. You may want to tweak it. You may have better lesson plans, but they're just there as a guide, guide to help, to, to sort of let you feel more comfortable and to be assured that, you know, what you're doing in class is correct. And then, of course, you need to check yourself. Okay. Um, when it comes to non-textbooks, Dr. Ramesh, you need to do a little more because you don't have the textbook as a reference, right? So um, if, you, if you actually think about it, non-textbooks, you need to go back to LMA materials, whatever slides, you know, and there are some slides which I keep in mind uh, because non-textbook is something we are stepping into which i mean like i don't have the expertise eh, to write a textbook which is cfr aligned so when i have to prepare materials i have to be careful so lma has taught given us some principles so one of them is you know the slide where you know what what it means when you say materials and language in the communicative classroom when you talk about meaningful realistic personalized and varied right and then when we talk about uh, differentiated learning, we need to take that into consideration because we have the circular which tells us that we are not allowed to do streaming anymore. Okay. Right? So our children are of mixed ability. So we need to address that. Yeah. Right? Okay. And as well as uh, we also need to look into the simple fact that you want to design. And if you want to design, are you sure it's going to be pitched at the right level? Okay. Or why don't you just use the four guiding principles given, which is uh, in the slide where you have adding, deleting, reordering, simplifying, modifying. This is one of the best courses in the sense that, okay, even with the textbook, I find it's too high, right? I can always do this, right? This is on this point, Pamela, um, uh, you know, materials adaptation is additional work, right? And, and fair enough, it's, it's fair to say that, you know, as teachers, uh, this is part of, you know, the package, right? right. This is what comes. How important do you think collaboration is amongst teachers, not, not necessarily even just within the school, but across school? Because, you know, if you're teaching a certain level and you have uh, the need to pitch your lesson lower or higher, then there are probably teachers in other schools are also doing this, yeah. right? Um, are there platforms where teachers can actually discuss and share material uh, based on your own experience? Yes. This is the amazing thing about Malaysian teachers. They're very well connected. There's actually a telegram group today, uh, CEFR secondary. Okay. I believe there's one CEFR primary as well. In the secondary, there are about 3,700 teachers mm -hmm. from all across. Mm -hmm. and uh, that group, some of them, you can really admire them. Ever willing to post their lessons, ever ever willing to share what they're doing in class with pictures or even things they pick up and they read. You know? so, and because Telegram allows much more than WhatsApp, so they keep posting in and then they're collaborating. Sometimes they're sharing their worries, their concerns, you know, recently, the, 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 the main issue is the SPM paper. Everyone is worried. Okay. 
what the paper is going to be like, right? But when the textbooks came out, they had a lot of concerns. And um, you also have teachers who are doing project-based learning and other things in school, and they take pictures and they share. And then we have some of them who are reading extra, you know, other, other books they come across and they will share. So um, you find that there is the avenue for collaboration. Whether everyone shares, that's a different matter, Dr. Ramesh, but things are heading that way, you know. Um, we also have a few officers there who need, you know, once in a way they need to keep people in track or things are not correct, they would put in a comment or two. So there is collaboration done on their own. I believe there are many more groups as well. I, and um, I, I hope the guide is something everyone picks up on, especially if you know you're unsure, right? Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Pamela. I think essentially what what uh, we hope the session, uh, you know, the, the takeaway from the session, uh, maybe just to to re reinstill in, in everyone's mind is the fact that the textbook essentially represents the ideal, and it serves as a guide to teachers to say where uh, the kind of material that your students are able to manage at the, in a particular year, right, particular right. form. Um, and this allows teachers, uh, if the, the students are not at an ideal level, to scale material down or up depending right. on the needs and then be able to talk about the performance of uh, the students in very tangible terms, what, what they can do. And this is, this is uh, essentially the whole aim of, of uh, using these uh, textbook-based and non-textbook-based lessons. And uh, I think what we have uh, also drawn attention to is how the, the term non-textbook-based lesson takes on a slightly different definition different outside uh, year one and yeah. year two as well yeah. as form one and form yes. two. Yes. And so uh, knowing this, uh, the hope is that, that teachers are able to uh, uh, adapt accordingly and to uh, ensure that whatever is delivered in the class uh, is uh, something that the children, the students enjoy. Right. And, and so the language classroom is a, a classroom where all four skills are practiced and the focus is on the skills, the uh, learning uh, out, uh, the, uh, the uh, learning standards and not on a cheat, yes not really trying to cover as much content as we can. Right. I think you need to pay attention to content as well because the content is actually the tool, uh, the, the tool for yeah. intru intru introducing vocabulary. Yes. Right? Uh, but it's not the Amish community which right. is the vocabulary that, that, is, that you need no. to, to ensure that the right. child knows, but it's you know, uh, probably, I don't know, about personalities and cultures yes. and practices. Yeah. But you see, with these textbooks, I am able to bring the world into the classroom and um, I mean, it gives me the opportunity because it's there, the books are colored, there are pictures. So I don't have to prepare all that. I just have to take off the discussion and do the language. And if teachers yeah? feel that the students are not ready to, yeah? to uh, you know, receive that kind of uh, yeah? information, then the textbook serves as a guide for you to bring in similar material of, of local content. Right. But you also find that in the course of time, yeah. From you know now, when we look at the textbooks now, the publishers have incorporated a little bit. Yes. Way, yes? Right. So yeah. like in years so three, year four, as well as form uh, four. Four, you right. see at least some sections with references to, Our to local Malaysian country. experiences. Yes. Yes. And this is this is a positive right. Uh, thing. Right. Can I just address one more concern yes. I've heard? Um, find in the non-textbook lesson because we are expected to do civics in English now, um, there's always this worry about whether that 112 lessons, you know, do you do away and just replace? So I will just share one example, not the perfect example, but something I tried recently. So we will look at this uh, the slide. This is lesson 13 in Form 4, non-textbook, because in Form 4, Literature in Action is non-textbook. Okay? And I was doing the poem, The Living Photograph. So what happened, I had uh, planned this for the fourth week of January because the fourth week I'm supposed to do one hour of civics in English. Okay. That has been set for us by ministry. So instead of 
uh, just doing something new from civics, I use this. Because living photograph is about a grandchild and the grandmom. The grandmother is in the photograph and then the relationship. And the, mo um, the moral value or rather the civics theme was love. So instead of something doing something new, I overlapped it with this. And my kids could take off on you know love for the elderly and how they take care and come up with I think maps on what they can do to help the elderly. So is the suggestion there for, for, for teachers to kind of see how to uh, fit match it. Yeah. right yeah. Uh, what's already in the scheme of work yes. to the requirements right. for the civics yes. in English uh, correct section. so you still can do the skill and overlap it and and not feel so upset that you have to you know out of the 112 lessons you have to throw some or delete some you know the main concern of teachers is always that okay, okay. All right. thank you thank you so much um, yeah, it looks like we've come to the uh, end of this, this webinar. I'd like to thank you, Pamela, for joining You're me welcome. today. Thank you, too. And I hope our short discussion on textbook and non-textbook based lessons uh, will serve to, you know, at least uh, stimulate some discussion and some thought on how best to deliver lessons in our classroom.